Ladies and gentlemen, the production you are about to see is a dramatization of true events that occurred in September of 1897. It is based on an editorial written in response to a letter sent to the offices of the New York Sun. It has since become the most reprinted newspaper editorial in the English language. My name is Mitchell, Edward P. Mitchell. I'm a newspaper man, and this is a newspaper story. You could have read about it on the front page of the New York Sun back in 1897. That's before people went out to the movies, long before people stayed home and watched <coughs> television. When people read books and told stories to their children. When people had to see things in their mind's eye and use their imagination. I'm going to ask you to use your imagination while we're here and while I tell you that story. As the lights illuminate different parts of the stage and then dim, I'm going to ask you to imagine that you're in another time and in other places. The city room of, the, of a newspaper. My office, I'm the managing editor. A small, shabby flat in New York City. Well, you'll see as we go along. By the way, I hope my cigar doesn't bother you. In those days, a lot of men smoke <coughs> cigars, and well, old habits are hard to break. But I'll try and puff down wind. <laughs> it's been said that every story needs to have a start and a finish, a beginning and an end. A lot of stories end in a cemetery. This one starts there. A man named Robert <coughs> Church, the best newspaper man who ever worked for me or anybody else. It's at the side of a grave. In his pocket, there's a gold watch, a watch that plays a tune as well as tells the time. And on the inside of the lid, there's a picture of his wife, Elizabeth. Oh, and in case you can't read the lettering on the tombstone from out there, the inscription says, Elizabeth Church, born August 3rd, 1868, died December 24th, 1896, and daughter Ellen died at birth. <coughs> The 19th century was coming to a close. New York City was stretching and growing in all directions. The city was running out of room, so it had to grow up. The buildings were getting taller. Underground tunnels were being built, and across the island of Manhattan, bridges were being constructed to carry thousands of people to and from their work. And from across the ocean, people came to find work and a new life. Italians, Greeks, Poles, Hungarians, Germans, Scandinavians, Syrians, Jews, Irish, and all the rest. That good-looking young fellow in the gray cap is James O'Hanley. I don't have to tell you where he came from. What cost do you have for doing that? You hit me, O'Hanley. You swung your bail right at me and hit me. Not true. I didn't even touch you. You call me a liar? Mick? Now that's the truth. Now if you'll excuse me, I got work to do. Did <laughs> it again. Hit me. Damn, Mick's coming over here taking all of our jobs. Hey! Go! That 
this for both of you. They told me if you started the fire again on Hallie, what is it with you, Irish? You're an angry liar, aren't you? Mr. Chambers, I had nothing to do with starting that well, fight. Well, you had something to do with the finish note. I'll give you that. You got the thump of Hallie. And I need workers on this dock, not troublemakers. You're true. You too, Don Ellie. Mr. Chambers, Dom had nothing no, to no, do with it. No, no, it's okay, Jim. It's okay. No, no, it's not okay, damn it. Goss is the one that's always starting it. This time he tripped me, called me a mick, and a pot. Goss may be a big at times. Dumb at times. <laughs> but he's been on the job a lot longer than the two of you. He pulled his weight on Hammond. And I don't. Dom and I don't pull our weight. <coughs> How would you know? You're never down here in the cold and snow and rain. You never lift anything more than a pencil. Mr. Chambers, I got three people that can take their place. My uh, you hear that? That's the reason behind it all. Surely you're not dumb no, enough. No, now, just a minute, Mick. I've had enough. Mick is it? <coughs> well, so have I. There's other jobs. Go find one. Go find two. <coughs> no. <coughs> you shouldn't have jumped in like that. What with your wife being so sick and all? I couldn't just stand by, James. You would have done the same for me. Come on. Yesterday's paper. You'll find something. I will. 
But until then, I've come home to find the bright and shiny faces of the O'Hanlon clan before they head off to school. And then what about President McKinley? President-elect, Grover Cleveland is still in office until the end of the year. James, will you be going out today? I will, as soon as I finish this bit of nourishment. And about you, Evie, have you had breakfast? I have. Good, well, then I'll walk Virginia and Sean down the block. But I'm having at Maria's. Her mother's so pretty sick. And Dominique's still found over her. Come on, Sean, me boy. What up? You to learn, me to earn. That's the spirit. <coughs> Trouble is, there's too damn much spirit and not enough jobs. James, the children. I know, aren't we lucky? They do favor your side of the family after all. Come on, children. During those days and part of the night, Frank Church was spending less and less time at his desk at the sun and more and more time worthy. And yes, drinking. His favorite watering hole was a place frequented by other gentlemen of the press, though not nearly as frequently. Brody's part of it. Mr. Church, can I get you some to eat? Mr. Church, some to eat? No? Morning, Mr. Barrington. Well, 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 fellow newspaper man. Take a look at his hair. But he was still here. Lay off, Cornelius. Shut up, George. And isn't a great moving reporter, the egalitarian editorializer, Frank himself. Church. Cornelius, let's get a drink. Friend and champion of the fallen man, would be slayer of the capitalist dragon, dreaming up more dribble against the aristocracy. Men like my uncle. Right, Mr. Church? Cornelius. Let's get something to eat and get back to the paper. Yeah, sure. You're looking for Dr. Livingston, Mr. Church. He's already been found in Africa, not in a bottle. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Those sounds you hear are a heartbeat and a pulse. Not of a man or woman, but of a newspaper. The city room of the New York Sun. That's right. A newspaper, like a human being, is a living creature. And every day, the life of a newspaper is filled with joy and sorrow, triumph and tragedy, with victory and defeat, just as in the lives of the people who read it. It's my job to get that paper to those people. A, S, D, F, G, H, J, K, L, A, S, D, F, Teddy, come here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, Mr. Mitchell. Have you seen Frank? Uh, he went out, Mr. Mitchell. Out where? Out the door. <laughs> uh, I don't know where, Mr. Mitchell. When? Uh, hours ago, maybe two. Well, when he comes back in the door, tell him I want to see him right away. Uh, yes, sir. He didn't give you any uh, copy on that shame of greatness editorial, did he? No, sir, Mr. Mitchell. Here, study this. You might grow up to be a great reporter yourself someday. Mr. Mitchell. What is it, Miss Warner? Did you like my piece on the man to go ball? I printed it, didn't I? Half of it. Yeah, that's the half I like. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Mitchell. Teddy. Yes, Miss Warland. What do you need? Some information. Oh, yeah. 
The shame of grace. What a shame. <laughs> Mr. Church, I know it's none of my business, but... That's right. Your business is society, isn't it, Miss Borg? Balls and teas and cotillions and such as that. Mr. Church, have you finished that article? <laughs> Just about, Miss Borland. <coughs> Just about finished. There has to be a finish to every story. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> God will sign with you. God be with you, Mr. O'Hanlon. And it must be so, Mrs. Goldstein. It must be so. Mr. Mitchell. Yes, Miss Borland, what is it? You want back the other half of your Vanderbilt piece? No, sir. What have you got there? Something I overlooked for the front page? Well, I ran into Mr. Church when I went out, but he wasn't feeling very well. Is that so? He asked me to give you this. I'll tell you something, Miss Borland. Yes, sir. Drunk, Frank Church is still the best newspaper man in this or any other town. <laughs> and Miss Borland. Yes, sir. Frank Church didn't always drink. Only since his wife and baby died. Almost a year ago. Gets in colder every night, Evie. Where's your song? The one your mother sent you for a ministry? The one she knitted for you to keep you warm? Ah, uh, Evie. Well, the yarn from that shawl was enough to make three gifts, James, for my loved ones. Besides, because I, I can't afford to buy gifts. Besides, I'm quite warm enough, thank you. And if it's warm to be needing, James O'Hanlon, then I know where to find it. Do you now? You should know better than the rest of the old Irish dog fighter like me. <laughs> Don't worry, they do that all the time. <laughs> Hi, Mama. Papa. And how are my favorite little girls today? Fine, Mr. O'Hanlon. And how's your mother, Maria? Not good at Mr. O'Hanlon. She talks a lot. She cares about all of us. I'm sure it's must. Your father still had no luck finding a job then either, huh? No, sir. Tell him I'm sorry. I feel like it's my fault. I'll tell him, but don't feel so bad, Mr. O'Hanlon. Mama says you're a fine man. Maria, I'll make some soup and bring it up to your mother. That and a prayer is the best medicine after all. Pop prays all the time. Sometimes I thank God when I have too much on his mind. How sick is she? Do you know? I hear the neighbors talking. They say Miss Donnelly might never get well. <coughs> Dear God. But she will. That's all Marie wants for Christmas. For her mother to get well. That's all she wants for Santa Claus.
Shame of greatness. Good stuff, Frank. Very good. You working on the Tammany Hall story? How's it coming? It's coming. Will it be finished in time to give the boys at City Hall a Christmas present? <laughs> It'll blow the pants off the boys at City Hall. If you'll print it. You write it, Francis. I'll print it. Miss Borland, I can't abide preciousness. <laughs> For writing that article and bylining my name. No, Mr. Church. I owe you thanks. For what? Do you remember lecturing out of journalism class a few years ago at NYU? <laughs> Not particularly. Well, I was one of three females in that class, and I was ready to quit until that day. It's because of what you said that I didn't. What you said and what you've written. Miss Borland. Please, Mr. Church, accept my thanks. Besides, they were your ideas. I just rearranged a few little words. If you say so. But that article, tomorrow it'll be yesterday's newspaper and you can wrap a fish in it. What do you mean? I mean, that's all it's good for. Nothing that you or I or anyone else writes for a newspaper has a lifespan of more than 24 hours. I don't believe that. That's your privilege and your delusion. Now, excuse me. <coughs> By the way, whatever happened to those other females from that class? They got married. Huh. They showed uncommonly good common sense. I'd like to thank you for the help, mister. Well, Highland, 
James O'Hanlon. O'Hanlon, eh? Good thinking. And good your fist, too, James O'Hanlon. I apologize for the mistake. Ah, it's not a problem. I can't thank you that, Mr. O'Hanlon. It's true, business has not been good lately. I can't offer much in reward, but Mata offered you and the family some fresh free bread and coat dust. I thank you, Mr. O'Hara, but no thanks. I agree. Come now, come now, me boy. It's the least I can do. Step inside and let me serve you a hot Irish. Tis the season, you know. That it is, Mr. O'Hara. That it is. is. You wouldn't we see that you get that paper to me, boy? Never mind that. <laughs> this paper 
It keeps me informed. It lets me know what's going on around us. It's like, it's like taking a world trip. It gives me hope that people do, in fact, achieve their goals. But it also lets me know that some people don't. But mostly, I choose to read about the positive things, not the obituaries. Papa, what's the obituary? The obituary? Uh -huh. It tells of death. I choose to read about life. Papa, do you think your paper could tell me if there's a Santa Claus? Virginia, if it's soaked in the sun, it's so. Thanks, Papa. people in the story. When he wasn't at Brody's Bar and Grill, Frank Church was <coughs> making noises on his typewriter, but he wasn't fooling me, or Andrew Borland, no. or himself. The next day, James O'Hanlon and Don Donnelly were back out looking for work, and Virginia was out looking for an answer. Someday, Mr. Church, I'm going to have a watch like that. What? A watch that's pure gold and plays a tune. A real humdinger. <laughs> sure you will. Boy! Boy! Dobby boy!
Yeah. Yeah, City Hall, got a hot tip. Well, don't let it cool off. Well, that took place after I'd gone through the day's mail. I knew something had to be done before it was too late. I wasn't sure exactly what that something was, but an idea had begun to form in the mind of a certain newspaper man. What is it, Ed? Happened to be in the neighborhood. Did you? Well, can I come in? You, uh, want a drink? Thanks, no. Well, what is it, Ed? Gotta be something. No, just a visit, uh, and an invitation. Martha wanted me to ask you if you wanted to come over for Christmas dinner. Could have asked in the paper. I suppose I could. Are you all right, Frank? Why? You have any complaints about my No work? complaints. Because there are a couple other papers. Frank! That... You've got to quit torturing yourself. Do I? It took me a good many years more than it does most men to find the right woman and marry her. She could have had her pick of a hundred better men. Young, rich, with the stuff proper husbands made up. Frank, it wasn't your fault. There was an epidemic. A lot of other wives died. Sure they did. They died with their husbands at their side. 
but not Elizabeth and the baby, Frank. We were married more than three years, and I never had Christmas dinner with her, not once. That first year, there was a flood in Pennsylvania, remember? And then a revolution in Asia. And when Elizabeth was dying of pneumonia, I was in Panama writing about young fever. Frank, Elizabeth married a newspaper man. She knew that. And she loved you. Did you ever hear her complain? No, I didn't. I never heard or noticed a lot of things until it was too late. Are you sure you won't have a drink, Ed? A close to Christmas drink? I'm sure. And Frank, you know you always have a home. Uh, don't worry, old pal. I'm still married to the newspaper. I promise to be a good husband. Yeah. You'll let me know about Christmas dinner. What are you doing? Uh, it's a little chilly in here. There. That's better. Now, by the way, Frank, uh, I've got an interesting assignment for you. I already have an assignment. The Tammany Hall expose, remember? This won't take long. I'm on a deadline. What is it? You know, that's newspaper business. I'll tell you about it at the office tomorrow. Good night. Ed? Yes? Thanks for lighting that here. I wouldn't want to catch pneumonia, would I? No. You wouldn't. Well, I wonder if you've guessed my little scheme and how, if it worked, it might affect the lives of Frank Church, Virginia O'Hanlon, the rest of these people, and maybe even you. We'll give you some time to think that over. Talk about it amongst yourselves if you like. Some of you old-timers out there might even want to grab a smoke. That's up to you. But if you do, don't forget, uh, there's no smoking in the theater. <laughs> <coughs> Start back with the rest of the story in just about uh, 10 minutes. Church was a man in need of a reason to go on living. As of yet, neither one was aware of the other, but I intended to do something about that. Before that long, cold December night had given way to the first light of dawn, James O'Hanlon was already out on the street. He had heard the place and might be doing some hiring. He wanted to be first in line for the job, and he was. James O'Hanlon had been standing in that cruel cold for more than an hour. Sure, well, in June. <laughs> what time is it? 
Back back there, Dia. Yeah. How do you get put the knot? I don't know. What's the pay? <coughs> what do you think pay? Ten cents an hour. What do you get? I mean, with weed at fifty cents a bushel, at seven cent cottage, and a working class at a working, and then for four overnight, and nobody gives a damn. This country is going to end in a hand. Well, if you don't like it here, brother, there's plenty of other countries. <coughs> Maybe the whole world is one country. You want to hear of a man named Karl Marx? No. You will. I don't want to hear about him unless he's got a job to offer. Maybe he does. The international workers of the world. Maybe he has productive jobs to offer. What are you standing around here for? Go find your friend Carl. Alright, let me through here. What? Uh, Fryer, I'll be the hire. Sorry, Mr. Fryer. Sure you are. Need one man, passing coal, one day, one dollar. Regular man be back here tomorrow. You men all look quite capable, so who was here first? He was. This man right here. Jim, what are you saying? You need to talk to me. your man, Mr. Fryer. Uh, follow me. <coughs> Merry Christmas. Have a great day. Merry Christmas. Jim, you need this job as much as I do. Not as much as Celeste does. Besides, I got to line on another job. I got to get going. Nice crisp day, huh, Frank? All right, Ed, what's the assignment? <laughs> Frank, you and I have worked together for a long time. Well, you've done most of the work while well, I sit here gaining weight and losing my eyesight. <laughs> you've covered wars, fires, famines, floods, anarchists, contagious diseases. That's my job. And there's nobody better at it. Ed, are you sure your middle initial's not B from Barnum or... Bunk them. <laughs> but this may be the toughest assignment I've ever given you. Big? Very big. Important. Very important. Dangerous? It could be. No, this is my idea of an assignment. Come on, Ed, I write editorials, remember? That's what I get paid for. I know for. what you get paid for, and this is going to be an editorial right on the front page. You said it yourself. Crime, corruption, controversy. That's what I write about. Not this time. Besides, this is controversial. Why don't you give this to that female reporter you hired? Because I'm giving it to you. <laughs> What do I know about all this? Frank, even you were a kid once. Yeah, it took years to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody gets over it. Frank, if you can answer this question, then you've answered a lot of other questions. You might not like my answer. I'll take that risk. Frank, maybe, just maybe, when all your other editorials are forgotten. When all the issues of today are resolved, a hundred years from now, when there are new issues to be considered, some kid will still be asking that same question, and you, Frank P. Church, will have already written the answer. And you'll print what I write? You write it, Francis, I'll print it.
Merry Christmas, Mr. Church. That night, Frank Church went back to his desk at the New York Sun. He put a sheet of paper in the roller of his typewriter. Thought about the question asked by eight-year-old Virginia O'Hanley. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? Virginia O'Hanley. Evie, 
How much longer am I to hold on? I have no hope left. I have to face this dark reality. How much more can a man take? I'm, I'm sorry, children. There was a crazy man here a minute ago. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's all right, Papa. Yeah, Papa, we'll leave. It's OK. Mm -hmm. station with us, please? What's this about, officers? It'll all be explained at the station. Mom, can you, Mama? Is my popping the red strip? Of course not, Sean. Is he, officer? <laughs> Mr. O'Hanlon is wondering and questioning about the attempted robbery at O'Hara's Bar Grill a short time back. But I already told the police everything I know. Please, <laughs> officers, it's Christmas Eve. Mr. O'Hanlon, we're well aware of the fact. We have families, too, you know. <laughs> it's that thief, isn't it? He said he'd get even. You see what I get for being a hero? Please, Mr. O'Hanlon. I'll get my coat. seen anything quite like the reaction, the excitement, as there was in what some call a jaded city room the day Frank Church's editorial appeared on the front page of the New York Sun in reply to the answer, reply to the letter from Virginia O'Hanlon. <laughs> Deal where Andrew Boyman was taken to Frank Church, and it wasn't to Brody's Bar and Grill. <laughs> that day, thousands upon thousands of people in New York City were reading his editorial. Well, in the years to come, that. it would be read and reread by millions, in many languages, in many countries, all over the world. But what about the little girl for whom it was meant? What about Virginia O'Hanlon?
Do you like it? Well, it's the most beautiful tree I've ever seen. But if you don't tell me what all this is about, I'll scream, or faint, or both. Virginia, place the gifts around the tree, and mind you, don't step on them, Charlie you boy. Think I won't. Now, Evie, don't scream or faint, just listen. Well, to make a long tail short. Speaking of tails. <laughs> Children, he was a pet when I needed one. James, how can we afford a dog? Much less all of this. <laughs> Letting me risk it? Oh, you? Ah, <laughs> uh, come now, let me tell y'all what happened. Tell us, tell us, tell us what happened. <laughs> well, it seems that fellow that I helped catch outside O'Hara's had himself quite a record in Chicago, and several other states wanted him bad enough to have offered a reward. Here you go, darling. Praise the Lord. Of course, that's what's left after I bought the tree and some gifts and a little food. I'll make it stretch. Only for a week. I got another surprise when I was at the police station. What? There's more? Well, it seems the fair city of New York is in need of police officers. And because of the incident at O'Hara's and at Sergeant Flynn's recommendation, they've asked me to become one of New York's finest. Oh, Papa, can't you <laughs> Not yet, Shani. Why well, I start the day after Christmas? That's when I get me badge, and so does Dominic Donnelly. What do you mean, Papa? Well, Sergeant Flynn said that his priest could use a few good men, so I recommended Dom. That's the best medicine Maria's mother could have. Um, Papa, can we open our gifts now? No, Christmas morning as always, Virginia. It's tradition. Well, I guess we can make an exception since tomorrow will be too late. <laughs> What's this, Virginia? Today's newspaper, Papa. Today's. Not this soggy, smelly one from yesterday. The newsboy let me have her for a penny. The spirit of generosity knows no bounds. Thank you, Virginia. I love you. I love you too, Papa. Well, since I won't be reading the help wanted section anymore. <laughs> Hold on a moment. Would you all come over here, please? And right on the front page, is there a Santa Claus? We take pleasure in answering at once and thus prominently the communication below, expressing at the same time our great gratification that its faithful author is numbered among the friends of the sun. Dear editor, I am eight years old. Some of my little friends say there is no Santa Claus. Papa says, if you see it in the sun, it's so. Please tell me the truth. Is there a Santa Claus? And it's signed Virginia O'Hanlon, 115 West 95th Street. Well, what did they say, Papa? Virginia, your little friends are wrong. <laughs> they have been affected by the skepticism of a skeptical age. They do not believe except what they can see. They think that nothing can be which is not comprehensible by their little minds. All minds, Virginia, be they men's or children's, are little. In this great universe of ours, man is a mere insect, an ant in his intellect, as compared with the boundless world about him, as measured by the intelligence capable of grasping the whole of truth and knowledge. Yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. He exists as certainly as love and generosity and devotion exist. And you know that they abound and give to your life its highest beauty and joy. Alas, how dreary would the world be if there were no Santa Claus? It would be as dreary as if there were no Virginias. <laughs> there would be no childlike faith then, no poetry, no romance to make tolerable this existence. We should have no enjoyment except in sense and sight. The external light with which childhood fills the world would be extinguished. Not believe in Santa Claus. You might as well not believe in fairies. You might get your papa to hire men to watch in all chimneys on Christmas Eve to catch Santa Claus, but even if they do not see Santa Claus coming down, what would that prove? Nobody sees Santa Claus, but that is no sign that there is no Santa Claus. The most real things in the world are those that neither children nor men can see. Did you ever see fairies dancing on the lawn? Well, of course not, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Nobody can conceive or imagine all the wonders that are unseen and unseeable in the world. You tear apart the baby's rattle to see what makes the noise inside. 
But there is a veil covering the unseen world in which not the strongest man, nor even the united strength of all the strongest men who ever lived can tear apart. Only faith, fancy, poetry, love, romance can push aside that curtain and view the supernal beauty and glory beyond. Is it all real? Ah, oh, Virginia, in all this world, there is nothing else as real in the Bible. No Santa Claus? Thank God he lives, and he lives forever. A thousand years from now, Virginia, nay, ten times ten thousand years from now, he will continue to make glad the heart of childhood. And now, children, it's time for bed. We'll open the rest of the gifts in the morning. I can come and wish. You have to, shot me, boy. We all will. No Santa Claus, thank God he lives, and he lives forever. You see, some stories don't really have an ending. They go on forever. So until next year, Merry Christmas.